God hates adultery so much he gave a command against it. It's the seventh command in the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20 verse 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. God put that in the law of Moses. Adultery. Adultery is sexual intercourse with a married person other than the one you are married to. And in Jewish thinking, it was one of the three gravest sins. It actually ranked with murder and idolatry. William Barclay, quoting Jewish sources, stated that every Jew must die before he will commit idolatry, murder, or adultery. Adultery was recognized as a great moral crime. And the reason is it's because it destroys. It destroys man's relationship with God. It destroys man's relationship with, with his wife. It destroys a man's relationship with his family. It destroys a relationship with his children. It ruins not only the relationship between a man and his God, a man and his wife, a man and his family, a man and his children, but it also ruins future generations. Because the children who were in a, in, you know, part of a family that was ruined through adultery lose the mother and lose the father as a, a union. And as a result of that, are raised very often without a father. And being raised without a father, they end up doing that which is pleasing in their own sight because who's there to control them? His mama's trying to put bread on the table and she's working and her children very often are left alone or in the company of others or being raised by their friends. And what they end up with is children in rebellion. And that's part of what we see today in the society that we live in, a, so a society that has been fragmented through the destructiveness of adulterous relationships that ruin marriages. It is a horrible sin, a horrible crime against God, a horrible crime against your marriage partner. It's a breach of trust because before God and man, we have made our oaths and promises to remain faithful and true so long as we both shall live. And then we breach that trust, that promise to God, and that promise to the one we loved, and we end up destroying families. It's a very serious sin. And because it is, God continuously warns against it and even says there's judgment because of it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul said it this way. He said, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. God repeatedly warns again against it and promises judgment. Hebrews 13 verse 14. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And so this was and remains a serious sin in the eyes of God. So they were bringing a serious test case to Jesus Christ. They wanted to deal with this because, like idolatry and murder, it was one of the three most grave sins in Jewish society. And so that's why they bring this woman to Jesus. They were waiting at her door until the unmistakable sounds of, of adultery were taking place. They rushed in, took her, and brought her, and now they have her there in the midst, and they're making the accusation. This woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Verse 5, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? Now, I want you to see this in verse 5 because they introduce their case by appealing to the Bible. Moses says they should be stoned to death. Now, they're trying to create a controversy between Jesus and Moses, the lawgiver. But John exposes their motives in verse 6 when he says, This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. And so they're just trying to, to catch Jesus. Basically what they're doing is they give him two choices, hoping to trap him that they might find an accusation against him. Here are the choices. One, if Jesus says then you need to put her to death, 
that's going to break the Roman law because the Jews are under Roman oppression at that time and do not have the right to enact capital punishment. According to John 18:31, when when the Jewish people, the authorities had taken Jesus before Pilate, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said to him, it is not lawful for us to put any man to death. We don't have the right to do that under Roman law. And so if Jesus said, well, then enact Moses' law and have her stoned, well, they would say that, that he's rejecting basically uh, Roman law, and therefore he's liable to prosecution. But if he says, let her go, then he's rejecting the law of Moses and will be judged a compromiser because his disregard for the law of Moses could be stated that he doesn't regard the word of God. And so what they're doing is they're trying to put him on the horns of a dilemma. They're trying to get him one way or another, and they think that they have him. Now, as we look at this, I want to I want to take a moment and and ask the question, what does this reveal about her accusers? There are three, three things that her accusers uh, we see revealed about their, her accusers as we look at this one. It reveals something to us about their concept of authority, the way that they wielded their authority. It, it reveals that they were people when they had authority who wielded it with severity. These were people who, who were, were, were the type that, that if they had power, they would use it against you. And that's what they're doing. In Matthew 23, verse 4, Jesus said concerning them, they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, lay them on men's shoulders. They themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. And so they wield their authority with severity like a club. Second, it reveals something about Scripture to them because uh, to them it's a hammer. They would follow the letter and disregard the spirit. You see, the fact is God's word has, has uh, prohibitions as, as well as encouragements. And the prohibitions are with good reason. Because if you follow his word, you're going to be kept safe. If you follow his word, you'll be all right. I mean, as a parent, I've told my kids, be careful not to do certain things. Not because I want to ruin their day or, or rain on their parade, but because I want them to be protected. So I'll say, you know, lock your doors when you're driving. Uh, fasten your seat belt. I'll tell my kids when they were small and not too too small. I never really left them. We didn't leave them. But when they were young teens, I'd say, I'm going to be gone for a while. If someone comes to the door, I don't want you just opening the door and, and to people you don't know. I mean, we do that. We teach them and we say, don't do this or do this for their own protection and their own help. That's just the way it is. My mom tried to teach me not to like fire when I was a kid. She'd say, fire burns. It wasn't because she was raining on my parade. It's because fire burns. And I still remember before my mom got saved, my mom used to smoke. And I used to think my mom was rather cool. I thought my mom looked very, very cool, as a matter of fact. Because she, she would put that cigarette in her mouth. And she would light the burner of the stove. And she would lean over there. And she'd light the cigarette. And then she'd kind of tilt her head back and take a hit off that cigarette and the smoke would waft and her eyes would get glazed and I thought, man, my mom, she looks so cool. I really do. I thought my mom, so cool. Well, when I was 15, I was part of a uh, style at that time called Continental. Unless you're my age, you don't know what that is. Unless you're from my area, you don't know what that is. But the Continentals, we dressed with slacks and cool shirts and wore pompadours and I had the pompadour probably don't know what a pompadour is just look at a 53 Chevy hood and that's a pompadour you know kind of rounded and all of that and I would spray it with I would spray my hair so hard I didn't need a helmet when I rode a motorcycle if I fell off it I cracked the pavement I mean I would spray it and it was just so hard and you'd form it like that you know and and all of that and so I, I, I started smoking at an early age and so I got my cigarette and I remembered how cool mama looked and and I remember walking up to that burner and lighting it and sticking my head there and the, my hair caught on fire and and and, and, and I went up like Wiley e. Coyote you know my hair is just all this smoke and I had the first afro in Norwalk you know it's just like that my mama told me you shouldn't play with matches and you shouldn't get near fire and she did that to try and teach me um, you know, danger. She would say, this is dangerous to you. Oh, by the way, my mom got saved and hasn't had a cigarette since she got saved, basically. She just quit. And she was a you know, pack-a-day person for as long as I can remember. But when the Lord got hold of her, you know, she became another great example to me, a great example of what God's power can do in a person who wants to break a habit. Because my mom had that habit for a long time, and then she broke it in the Lord Jesus Christ.